so good to be here with you today and to be able to come and share the word. And uh, here's the deal. I don't want to just speak a word. I want Jesus to manifest the word in your hearts and in our room here. And so I really believe that that is um, the role. It's for him to speak to you, for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And I'm just a vessel. Amen? Amen. So we're both vessels. You're a vessel of hearing, and I'm a vessel of sharing. And together, we're going to hear from God. Amen? Amen. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you right now to come and stir up our spirits. Would you stir up the gifts within us? Holy Spirit, come and stir our hearts and our minds so that we can open them up. Open our eyes and our ears so that we can hear and see you. And Lord, we just want to declare right now that we come into agreement, alignment with Your will. So Lord, let Your kingdom come. Let Your will be done this morning as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, Amen. So you're on a series uh, out of Galatians 5 on the, um, the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, Pastor Bruce kicked it off last week, and I was with you last week. Did you see me? No, but I was online. I saw, I saw, I saw well, I didn't see you either because the cameras don't catch you all back there, but I could hear you. I was with you nonetheless. Um, but I also actually drop in quite often, and so I uh, get to uh, share with you some life. So that's really good. Um, I am talking about joy today, and I titled this Choose Joy because joy is more than an emotion. I think sometimes we've kind of thought maybe it's just an emotional. I never feel joy. I don't I don't feel happiness. I don't feel and I here's what I've discovered. I discovered that when you choose something, the emotions take a while to catch up to your choice. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about today where joy comes from, how we can apprehend it, and how we can live it out. Sound good? Let's do this together. I think we could all agree that life has been hard, especially now. Our world is very dark. I don't know if you, I I stopped watching news. I can't watch it anymore. But sometimes on that social feed, something pops up and you just can't help yourself and you listen for a minute and then say, I thought I wasn't listening to this anymore and you turn it off. But our world's very dark. But I believe this, I believe that in great darkness, God's light shines brighter. And I want to challenge you today, church, to that it's time to shine. It's time to see the fruits of the Spirit manifest through your lives more than ever. Our world needs it. You have neighbors, you have friends you work with and people you work with that don't know where to turn. And they're turning to a lot of places that aren't actually bringing them joy. It's actually bringing more sorrow. Amen? And so I want to challenge us today to, to, to understand that we are actually the ones who are called. If we don't see joy in the world, don't complain, look inside. 1 Thessalonians 1.6 says this, And you become imitators of us and the Lord, for you receive the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So it was in much affliction that they received this word and they receive joy. So the first thing we see here is that joy comes from the Holy Spirit. Amen. I spent many years of my life trying to find joy in all the wrong places. In addiction, I was looking for joy in, in being accepted, being validated. I, I, I grew up... Uh, feeling like I was a failure, believing that I was a failure, and I couldn't find joy. So when somebody showed me any kind of kindness at all, I would just jump right to it, and I would do whatever I could to make them happy. This led to drug addiction and alcoholism and to a lot of sorrow in my life. In fact, my wife and I met in the middle of that sorrow. So I looked to her for joy. But when she didn't bring it, it was disappointing. You get what I'm saying, right? We can look for it in all the wrong places, but joy, and I'm going to make a very bold declaration, is only found in one place. That's in the Lord. It's the joy of your salvation. 
that will bring you happiness in your life, contentment in your life. 1 Peter 1, 8, 9 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, uh, now, do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Isn't that amazing? You see, you're looking for evidence of joy before you're going to accept it. Imagine if we did that with salvation. If we, we'd say, okay, God, you prove yourself to me first. I want to see physical evidence that you died for me. No, we know that by faith. We know that because the Lord reveals his heart to us. We know that because Jesus has touched our lives in some way and revealed his heart to us. And so what's happened is we believe even though we can't see him. Well, in the same way, we apprehend joy even when we don't feel it. That's his promise. And where it comes from, it comes out because we've the outcome of our faith is the salvation of our souls. So we have the joy of our salvation because of what God has done. Amen? Hebrews 12.2 says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Anytime you see right hand in the Bible, it's speaking of the authority of God. So Jesus sat down. So what I was, when I was studying, actually, God showed me something. And, and, I'd, and I'd never seen it before. And I'm not suggesting that we change the word. <laughs> so don't hear what I'm not saying. But you could, inter, you could uh, switch joy and faith in this scripture. I'm going to read it that way. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our joy, who for the faith set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Faith and joy are intermingled. You can't have joy without faith. You can't have faith without Jesus. Can I suggest to us that we don't need just faith in Jesus, we need the faith of Jesus manifesting in our lives. When you have the faith of Jesus manifesting in your life, what you're going to have is joy bubbling over. No matter what the circumstance is. True joy is found in the presence and goodness of God. I loved our song selection today. True joy is found in the presence and goodness of God. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is in your, is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by His love. He will exalt you with loud singing. Oh, can you imagine heaven? But didn't you just feel a little bit of that today? As we were singing, Jesus, make us new wine. Release more wine from us. Release your heart from us. I could just feel his heart singing over us. He was so pleased. You know, the Bible tells us that only faith pleases God. And the faith that it takes to apprehend joy in the midst of crisis pleases his heart. And I think it attracts him to you even deeper, even more. And he will come and he'll scoop you up in that crisis. And you will have joy in the middle of crisis. Because here's the deal. Suffering and joy are intrinsically linked. We can't avoid one to have the other. You can't just have joy without some suffering in the contrast of it. Let me share a story with you. The plague of Antonine. In the Roman Empire in about 165 to 180 AD, there was a plague that covered the land. And it was killing thousands and thousands of people. Way worse than COVID. And of course, back then, they didn't have the medicines that we have. And they don't have the ability. So people were dying in droves. It was so bad that they, they actually 
Whole towns would be, uh, the, the, the Roman army would come and actually cordon off a whole area where the thing out broke because they didn't want it going past. And it was so pervasive that even the guards that were keeping people in were dying because it was so bad. In the center of that is this new church. If you think about the timing here, it was not long after that first church was established through Christ and through the disciples. And, and so this was the early church, uh, kind of the descendants of the early church that were in the midst of this Roman Empire at the time. And it was amazing because what happened was is the church rose up in that time and they went and cared for the people that the Roman government abandoned in these cities. They would put themselves in harm's way. And one of the uh, great philosophers of the time was, uh, was found to say this. His name was, uh, uh, I'll butcher it, but uh, Donasios. Close anyway. Boy, that's hard to see. But I'll read it to you. This is what he said. He said, heedless of the danger, they took charge. He was speaking of the church. They took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life, serenely happy. That word serenely means joyful. So, they attended to the needs of the people, and they were happy about it. They had joy because they were attending. In their death, they were full of joy while they were attending the sick. It says, for they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. Many in nursing and curing others transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead. Methinks the church of North America would fall short of that. But I believe that we are being called in this hour, in this day, and this is a prophetic word that I'm hearing, but also that I'm hearing from the Lord. It is time for the church to rise up Amen. in the joy of the Lord, in the faith of the Lord, in the peace of the Lord, and bring the suffering to an end for the people. Isn't it interesting how our, us as believers suffering actually is a gateway to other people's joy? Amazing. Here's part of the problem. Resistance to pain is what creates suffering. We've become too comfortable, maybe. But it's that resistance to pain. Have you ever noticed that? When, when there's something going on, maybe it's a relational breach, maybe it's, it's you know, sorrow, maybe you've lost somebody, and there's pain in it, and you, you try to resist that pain. I don't want that pain. You try to push it away. Have you ever noticed how it actually takes you over? It's the suffering comes when we resist the pain. I often say, what you resist persists. What you resist persists. Instead, I believe that we should be surrendering that pain or bringing it to the Lord so that He can join us and he can, we can meet with Him in our suffering. As He suffered, we suffer, we will both find joy. We all experience pain. There's no question about that, folks. We all experience it. And I'm not suggesting or trying to minimize what you've experienced. And I want to just put a little caveat in here before I keep going. And that is this. Listen, mental health is a real thing. The church ignored it for far too long. I believe it's just as important ministry as any other ministry we've done in the church. And yet, all we've told people is just have more faith, we'll pray, and everything will be okay. And that's not always true. So I, this is not what I'm saying today. But what I have seen is when the Lord comes into someone's life, even with mental health, they can find a joy in the Lord in the middle of it. And we need to offer that hope to them and walk with them in that. But that doesn't mean we abandon them if they have a bad day the next day. It means that we come again and we pray and believe for the joy of the Lord to manifest. And I think that that's so important. It's the resisting that creates the suffering. When you trust Jesus... 
You can accept the pain you are experiencing today because you know what lies ahead is far greater. That's the joy of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Jesus learned obedience through the suffering is a simple fact. He learned obedience through suffering. If you think about him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's, he cried out to the Lord and said, you know, it, it, the scholars say that he was probably sweating blood, like literally blood vessels were popping. He was feeling the pressure of our sin coming on him. And he said, Father, if you can take this cup from me. And he says, yet not my will, your will be done. In the center of the suffering, he turned to his Father. And he learned obedience. He learned obedience, and God was faithful and just. In Hebrews 5, 8, 9, it says, Even though Jesus was God's Son, He learned obedience from the things He suffered. In this way, God qualified Him as a perfect high priest. Remember last time I was here, I talked about the high priest. And He became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey Him. Isn't that awesome? What a promise. When you're suffering, move in the opposite spirit. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. John 16, 22 says, Also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Here's something you need to know about joy. Because it's the Lord and it belongs to the Lord, joy is for eternity. Yes. Right now, the joy is a bit covered up and screened by the earth and the world that we live in. Sometimes we've got to look pretty hard to find it. But there's a day that will come when we will stand in heaven and joy will have no filters. Amen. The secret of contentment here on earth is that the joy you choose is in all, in all circumstances. So the secret of contentment in your life on earth is to choose joy in every circumstance that you're in. Makes sense, doesn't it? You see, you, re- you rise and reign in the best of times and in the worst of times. You are sac- those are sacred moments, good and bad. As his sons and daughters, we thrive in the best of times and the worst of times, for we have eternal hope. We have eternal joy. We have eternal faith. We are not anchored to this world. We're anchored to the heavenly realm. Amen. Yes. We're, hev- we're anchored to Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father. We're in Christ. Oh, that makes all the difference, folks. Mm-hmm. All ground becomes holy to those who do not lose hope. Keep your eyes of your heart fixated, fixed on, transfixed on Jesus, learning to recognize his voice and agreeing together confidently with his voice. Joy is the result. Isn't that interesting? You got to remind yourself when you're going through a crisis and a hard time, I'm not anchored to this circumstance. I'm anchored to Christ who is in the heavenly realm. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm not anchored to this problem. I'm anchored to Jesus. I'm not anchored to this problem. I'm anchored to His love. I'm not anchored to this situation. I'm anchored to His joy. I'm not anchored to depression. I'm anchored to joy. I'm not anchored to mental health. I'm anchored to Christ who strengthens me, who I can do immeasurably more than I could hope or imagine. Through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Joy is the result. I feel the joy rising up. Listen, it's okay to acknowledge the pain. However, it is better to turn to the one who heals it. The church is called to show the world that Jesus is their healer and their joy. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we as followers of Jesus need to remind our face of that. Sometimes we need to remind each other of that. Now, we don't remind each other of that saying... Why are you always so grumpy? (laughs) We remind each other of that by going to them and saying, I am overwhelmed with joy when I see you. When I look at you, when we come and gather together, and I see you come in that door, my heart's filled with joy. Why? Because I see Jesus in you. Folks, it's time to lay down offenses. It's time to lay down the things that cause us strife 
that caused that suffering, and it's to bring them to Jesus and say, Jesus, you are my joy, and I will walk in joy. I will apprehend joy because you have provided it to me. Amen? Amen. Luke 2, 10 and 11 says, But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid. He said, I, will, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. You know you have good news living in you that will bring joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. I don't know why that's just a Christmas verse. That's an everyday verse. That's an everyday verse. Wow. Henry Nouwen said this, Joy does not simply happen to us. We must choose joy and keep choosing it every day. Amen? I believe that. Your choices create a cause and effect in your life is the simple truth. So there's two ways that, ca- that kind of cause and effect manifests in your life. One is internally. Your self-talk. Talking to yourself about yourself. How many have ever been trapped? You don't have to put your hand up, but I'll put mine up. Trapped in negative self-talk. It's really hard to find joy when you're locked in that negative cycle of self-talk. That self-talk can either be constructive or destructive. For many years, it was destructive for me. I would remind myself how much of a failure I was. I would remind myself of how everybody else has things and I don't. I'd remind myself of how other people are loved, but I'm not lovable, so I'm not loved. And at the same time, I'm searching for joy. Definition of crazy. (laughs) The problem with cause and effect is that it's not just internal, it's also external. It's how others talk, uh, like others talk. In other words, how you talk about others. And that's either a blessing affirmation or it's curses and witchcraft. Strong word. But that's what it is. When we talk negatively about others to others, what's happening is that's the internal dialogue coming out of us towards other people and it's literally casting a spell. Jesus redeem that he healed that you have all authority and power part of the problem with having that authority and power is god has given you authority through the power of your words but words carry life and death in them and so when you use those words to bring death you will be responsible and you need to bring that to the lord and say lord clearly there's something internally going on here because my external words are harmful and you repent, and you ask Jesus, and you take apprehend his joy and say, you know what happened? It's very interesting, because when you do this, your view of others changes. When your view of yourself changes, you'll start to see others in a different light. Cause and effect, there are only two choices that will cause an effect in your life that produces the two fruit lists in Galatians. Self, or the Holy Spirit. Your soul or your spirit. Now, you'll remember, I'm going to show you a graph that I showed last time because it's actually fitting for this message. As I was preparing, the Lord reminded me and I went and grabbed it and put it in here. But I'll do that one next. Here's, the, here's what I want to say. Thoughts manifest words and words manifest belief. You'll have a feeling And then you have a thought around that feeling or perception or emotions, whatever you want to put there. I always say perception's reality, but it's not always actuality. You have a thought about it. And then as you dwell on that, it'll start coming out in words. And you can actually form a belief. Let me illustrate this. I could actually be feeling like somebody is against me. I'm feeling overwhelmed by my circumstances and nobody's helping me. I I feel like I'm not loved. So my thought is, nobody cares about me. I'm just not even worthy. The church is so, and then it starts going outwards. The church is just so unloving. 
They never bother with me. They never find out what's going on for me. I'm just like sitting here in pain and nobody seems to care. And that goes around and around and around. And what happens is a belief is created and a belief system is the church is... I grew up believing that every single Christian were hypocrites. Because I allowed that mindset to enter my mind and I renumerated on it all the time. And by the way, every time I came across a Christian, they helped prove my point. (laughs) Own it. Take responsibility. It's okay. Isn't that that true though? (laughs) Beliefs become practices or expressions or behaviors or could I say fruit. Why do I keep doing the things I don't want to do, but I can't seem to do the things I want to do? Because our source is off. Because we're trying to do it in our own strength. We're trying to find it outside of ourselves somehow to to validate something inside us that we've had this negative narrative going on. We can't find it. Have you ever noticed that it seems when you're critical of somebody, you can always find someone else who is also critical of them? That's why. So, you can choose yourself or your soul or your own desires and that's called the fruit of the sinful nature. That's that negative list in Galatians. I'll read it a little later. In emotions. Or you can choose Jesus and you're going to see the fruit of the Spirit or joy come from your life. Makes sense, doesn't it? Here's the graph that I had here last time and I put it in the context of this message. You can flip the page to the next one. And you might remember it. You need to take a picture. No? Oh, yeah, that's that one. That's the one. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to have to do my slides darker next time. Oh, they're pretty good up there. That's good. Yeah. So where does the fruit come from? Well, your choice determines, remember cause and effect, your choice determines the source. Your source feeds your emotions, in other words. So if you're going to pluck from the tree of knowledge... If you're going to try and find, uh, find God's will outside of God, that you, you, you try to like, satisfy your soul somehow. I want to feel better about myself. I want people to validate me. I want them to love me and show me love. And you know what's amazing is when you have this negative narrative in your head, it doesn't matter what someone will do for you, you won't see it as love. It's almost impossible to receive love from that place. But, so, if your soul or, or your tree of knowledge is feeding your feelings, then they're going to be negative. It's going to be hard, hard to find joy. However, the tree of life, Jesus is called the tree of life. When you go to Jesus, He will minister to your spirit, and that means that He will, your spirit or His spirit, will feed your emotions. That will be the source of your emotions. And guess who's, what emotion is in Jesus? Joy. Peace, love. So your thoughts, track with me now. So you have a feeling and then you have a thought. Remember the last slide. If you choose the tree of knowledge, you're going to be double-minded and controlled by instability. Anybody experience that? Boy, have I ever. When my thoughts are double-minded, what happens is I will create a belief system in that double-mindedness and my behaviors will reflect it. So the fruit is anger, hurt, addiction, jealousy, pride, sexual immorality. You can go through that whole Galatians list. That's the results. And then, when I partake of that fruit, I feel condemnation. I feel like I failed. I feel like I can never do enough. I don't fit in at church because I'm not good enough like them. But if you go on the tree of life side, what happens is he informs your emotions and then you have the mind of Christ, what the Bible calls the mind of Christ controlled by the Holy Spirit. So guess what? Your behaviors will reflect that. Your actions, your expressions, your life will reflect that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness long-suffering, the whole list of fruits. Here's what I want to say to you about this. You can't create joy, love, 
and all those things. You can't create enough of it to satisfy your soul. It's already living in your spirit. You just got to let your spirit inform your soul. Amen? Amen? When you do that, and by the way, if you see the wrong list manifesting, it's not because you're a horrible person. It just tells you. It's an indicator. It's, a, it's like a meter. It's like a, a thermostat. It's just, it just tells you, uh-oh, I need to get back to Jesus. I need to bring this issue, this situation, this hardship, I need to bring it to Jesus, and I need to bring Jesus to it. And when I do that, what happens is he will start to change my thinking about it. Amen. And all of a sudden, I'm more than a conqueror. I can do immeasurably more than I could hope or imagine through Christ who strengthens me. All of a sudden, his word starts to rise up in my heart and my mind. And all of a sudden, I can find, oh, there's joy in the middle of the suffering. Joy starts to come out. I can't imagine those people in that Roman time running into the problems with joy, knowing that they could die, believing God can heal them, but being willing to die. Amazing, amazing. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up in about 20 minutes. Okay. Here's, I just want to break this down. So the cause, choosing self, the effect is my sinful nature governs me. I feel rejected. My thoughts are, no one loves me. Your words come from the pain and are harsh to yourself and to others. Your belief is that it proves your feelings are right and that you believe that you are, you're, that you are worthless and that you allowed, uh, always need to prove and protect yourself. Your actions become defensive and destructive and the result is sadness and loneliness. But if the cause is choosing Jesus by faith, the effect is Jesus' words and character governs me. I feel loved. Your thoughts are, I, I am secure in who Jesus has made me. Your, wor your words are edifying and uplifting, and your belief is that I am so loved, I am loved so that I can love others. Your actions are serving others and doing good regardless of the circumstances, and the result of that is joy, even if it kills me. Isn't that amazing? So, cause and effect, which fruit are you going to choose? Holy Spirit's or your sinful natures? When you put it so simply, it, pretty, it, it makes it pretty clear, doesn't it? I choose you, Jesus. Galatians 5.19, here's our text for this series. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, host hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, di dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. I like how we like to focus in on the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but we tend not to look at the envy, jealousy, division, what I call the soft sins of the church. They, they bring the same results. Good news, though, in verse 22, but the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Amen? Oh, Holy Spirit, right now, release joy in this house. Release joy in this house. Release joy in the homes of the people represented at Highway Church, Lord. Those that are here, those that are not here, Lord, we release joy. Lord, I release joy into the worst situation that each person is facing right now. Lord Jesus, would you release joy in their heart? Would change their view of it by simply releasing your joy in their heart? Yes, in Jesus' name. Goes on in verse 24 and 6 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature.
to the cross and crucified them there. Just want to make the parallel here. We suffer with Christ, so we, su- we suffer with Him. We have His joy with Him. He suffered the cross, so we can nail ours to the cross. Amen? Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Oh, I say yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord. Galatians 6, 8, 9 says, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from their sinful na- that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time. We will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Now that is joy. That is joy. Thank you, Jesus. I will never give up. Not because I have any strength in me or because I'm, not, I'm strong, but in my weakness, God's perfect, strength is perfected. And when I put my heart in Him, boy, let me tell you something, I will not ever give up as long as I'm in Christ. Amen? Amen. Oh. Amen. Folks, that's joy. So, Highway Church, will you choose joy today? Yes. Let's stand up and praise the Lord. Let's give Him thanks right now in Jesus' name. Ben can come. Let's just start to praise Him. Use your voice. Maybe you're not used to this. Just say, Jesus, thank You for Your joy. Declare it. Thank You for Your joy, Jesus. I receive it for myself. I receive it for my family. I receive it for my situations and my circumstances. I receive it for my workplace. I receive it for my neighborhood. I receive it for my church. I receive it for my children and my grandchildren and their children to as many generations that come. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.